Um, it's still pretty early, but we have a fair few people already here, so I think we can get started. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Hannah Katz, and I am the Grant and Education Manager here at Juvene. Juvene is the leading cultural nonprofit organization dedicated to serving emerging and established artists through the collaborative creation of contemporary art using the process of handpicked for making. Our program includes residencies, fellowships, and workspace opportunities for artists, workshops and educational programming for all ages, and exhibitions and publications. This program is made possible by support from the New York State Council on the Arts with support of the governor and the New York State Legislature, the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, and generous foundation and individual support. Please use the Q&A function to submit questions throughout the talk, and we'll come back to all of your questions at the end. Um, you can also turn on captions by clicking the show captions button at the bottom of your screen. Um, without further ado, I'm honored to introduce today's artist, Mae Babcock. Mae Babcock is an interdisciplinary American artist whose work is rooted in hand paper making in place and involves turning plants and seaweed into paper. Her practice reconnects people to the voice of the land and waters, transforming plant fibers, sediment, and site materials into expansive installations, organic sculptures, analog photos and prints on paper, and textured two-dimensional works of paper. Her artwork intersects the fields of hand paper making, contemporary craft, book arts, ecological art, gardening, public art, community building, sculpture, installation art, printmaking, and analog photography. May teaches and exhibits widely and has been the recipient of numerous artist residencies, grants, and fellowships. She is also a certified invasive, invasive plant manager and master gardener. Welcome, May. Thanks so much, Hannah. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me to come speak with Dudene, and thank you everyone who um, made the time to attend today. Excited to be here. Um, oops. Okay. Oh, I first wanted to do a land acknowledgement for where I am in Rhode Island. So the land I sit on is the traditional territory of the first peoples of Rhode Island, Narragansett, Wampanoag, Yantic, Nipmuc, and Pequot. Following their examples and resilience through centuries of colonization, I encourage good ecological citizenship and responsibility of the local waters, lands, and living things. And we'll jump right in. So my place-based approach to making artwork really started in graduate school, where I went to Louisiana State University for printmaking. Um, I grew up in Connecticut and then moved to Louisiana and I started just sketching and observing and learning as much as I could about the local landscape. And I think these activities were a way for me to orient myself and to understand this new place where I lived. So I ended up being mostly drawn to these sort of degraded sites like abandoned sugarcane plantations, old locks, like boat locks to the Mississippi River, rusty old bridges. Um, and the work was really, a, I think, a psychological expression of how I felt uh, while being in these types of sites. So kind of raw and dark and degraded and like I really wasn't supposed to be in these places. And sometimes I probably shouldn't have. And <laughs> I think I did get questioned at some point and I was like, I'm a artist and student. <laughs> so, and they're like, okay, it's fine. <laughs> um, so through paper making, I found I could engage with materials that had a direct relationship with these places. And I use bagasse, which is the fiber left over from processing sugarcane. Uh, I use that for much of my thesis work. So on the left is a photo of Alma Sugar Plantation. That's actually like eight acres of bagasse. The mound's like 30 feet high. It's like dating from the 1800s. Um, I think they burn as much as they can for fuel. And then it's just like leftover ag or waste. So they said, you know, take as much as you can. I took a few garbage bags uh, full for that. And I think it's this like using and touching and transforming that fiber. It, that process became a way 
uh, for me to have a relationship with place through my material choices. So with paper making, you know, I think cooking, you're rinsing the fiber, pulping it up, and then forming sheets. Um, and then in turn, you know, the resulting artworks and the materials and the way they're made is kind of a way to also bring these degraded landscapes into the cultural conversation through art. This is Bagass Construction, and it's a sculpture that was a study for me, like also a study of how this material naturally wanted to behave. Um, it's 100% bagass, um, and then the shape itself is sort of meant to mimic books and also the slope of the Mississippi River levee. So this place-based approach to making work. So, you know, studying a site, using materials from the place, and then also spending time to research the histories, geologies, hydrologies, um, and putting that all in the art blender and out comes art. So that method continued when I moved to Rhode Island. Um, I think that was around 2012. Um, so these are some of the first works I made um, up here. Um, these are what I call pulp types. So if you're similar to, or if you're familiar to monotype printmaking processes, it's kind of the same idea, um, except these are all paper pulp and there's no ink, printmaking ink involved. So these are based off of you know, shoreline sketches of, along the Seekonk River, actually. Um, this is another installation I did that was part of the same show. Um, and it was one of my first works where I use invasive plant species uh, as a paper making fiber. And I think, you know, using these invasive plant species and looking at what plants were growing is the way to also familiarize myself with the local landscape and plant life. Um, so choosing invasive plants as a fiber for paper making is pretty attractive. And I think simply because there's a, they, there tend to be a lot of them, an abundance of them all in one place. So you don't have to like go to different sites to get enough fiber. Um, and people are generally happy that <laughs> you're removing them and doing something um, with the material. So because there's so many in one place, it makes for easy removal and easy processing of the plants. Um, just to like step back here, let's define, you know, invasive plant, that term. So in the scientific community, invasive plants are defined as non-native plants, so plants that aren't native, that cause economic or environmental harm. Um, and it's also interesting to note, um, you know, as I'm like learning about these invasive plants that, you know, the tendency is that the more a site is disturbed by humans or construction or whatever, the more invasive plants there are. It's a, actually a pretty direct correlation um, in most cases. Um, this is water chestnut. Uh, the scientific name is Trapa natans. Uh, it's a pond weed that's become very successful in many freshwater ponds and lakes in Rhode Island. I think also it's prevalent in um, like Lake Champlain, like upstate New York and northern Vermont up there. Um, this uh, photo on the left is from my kayak and that's a 10 acre pond. That's not a field. <laughs> it's all water chestnut. Um, this plant is actually really interesting because it's actually native to parts of Europe and Asia. And even though it's invasive here um, in North America, it has in some parts a rare and endangered status um, in some parts of Europe, I believe. So it was like brought over, uh, let's see, 1877 um, for some botanical gardens at Harvard University and it escaped cultivation as plants do, um, and it was found growing in like nearby rivers uh, only a few years after that. So it's not the same, um, you hear water chestnut, that colloquial name, it's, uh, it's not the same water chestnut 
you would find in Asian cuisines, um, but actually it does produce like this scary, dark, black, spiky nut that you can eat the inside, it's, it's edible. Um, so in my public artwork, I used water chestnut both for the paper making fiber and I also printed their silhouettes um, of the plants using a historical photo process called cyanotype. So like on the left, you can see the water chestnut plant. It's actually this really, I think it's really, really actually beautiful rosette sort of structure. Um, and then cyanotype, if you're not familiar, is also called like a sun print. It's also like a blueprint process where I coat the paper with chemistry, lay something down to block the light, which in this case is the water chestnut plant itself, expose it. Uh, wherever it's exposed to sun is that nice dark Prussian blue and everywhere else like rinses out to show the paper underneath. So these works were, there are six of them, they're wheat pasted around downtown Pawtucket, Rhode Island. Um, and uh, these sort of became also a way to bring local waterways and plant life um, into this sort of urban landscape and urban context. So funnily enough, it wasn't um, until I was asked to speak on a panel um, for the one of the North American hand paper makers conferences back in like 2019. Uh, it wasn't until then um, when I started, until I started thinking about the Asian diaspora in paper making. And that's also when I started to make more connections between my personal background and identity and my art practice. So like, why, why does my work involve, you know, so much trying to understand complexities of place um, and also like the significance in using uh, many so-called invasive plant species. So plants that are from other places. So my mother was born in Taiwan, her, uh, parents before her were born in mainland China. On my father's side, our family history actually goes back to the 1600s when Europeans first colonized New England. Um, and I actually have a somewhat well-known ancestor, John Eliot, who was the first to translate the Bible into a written version of the uh, Algonquin language. And it was also the first Bible printed in North America. Um, so often those in diasporas feel untied. So not really part of the home country, but also, you know, sometimes too different to feel included as a transplant. Um, and at the same time, identity, I think is intrinsically tied to place. And this sort of seeing and embracing and empathizing with places through plant fibers and plants that have also traveled long distances and transforming them in my paper studio is actually a way for me to create connections and relationships with places. For me, I, I, really, I can't just read about a place. I want to like spend time in landscapes I want to feel and touch site materials to better understand a place and my own position in them as well as you know, a human's position in the landscape. So these thoughts took shape in a few different places in my work. And one of them is my Rhode Island herbarium series here where I embed seaweeds I find at specific waterways and then I gild the place name uh, in metal leaf underneath. I started thinking about how the range of species over time changes at specific sites, just like how place names also change over time and according to different peoples. So for this series, I actually gild a mix of the common name. I do the Google Maps name, and then I also research the indigenous uh, place names. So my dad is actually a translator and does like Chinese to English translation. So he helps a lot here, helping to find and translate the Algonquin place names. So he uses the, actually the John Eliot Algonquin Bible to figure out the correlating 
terms and figuring what they exactly mean. So this seaweed, Gratilupia, I uh, found at Rome Point, it's a colloquial name. On Google Maps, it's Chafee Preserve. Narragansett name is actually Namcook, which uh, roughly translate. So Namash means fish, and then cook is could either mean like a neck of land or a fishing place. So from there, you can sort of understand, um, you know, what that place meant to Narragansetts. Um, <clears throat> and then also, you know, learning about seaweeds is complicated as well. <laughs> I feel like I do my best with identification. I feel like this is actually Gratilubia Toro um, which is, you know, from the Pacific Ocean off the coast of Japan. So in researching um, invasive plants and learning where they come from, I started to see stronger connections and parallels between immigration stories and the movement of plants around the globe. So this is called Rome Point Seaweed Constructions, and I use a seaweed called Codium fragile. Um, it's, I used it to make these paper sculptures and it's a seaweed that originates from the Pacific Ocean um, off the coast of Japan and it arrived um, off the coast of North America in the Atlantic Ocean back in the 1950s. So here it can be pretty problematic for coastal ecologies because it can displace um, eelgrass and eelgrass is needed for like baby shellfish like oysters and clams and all that. Uh, they need the eelgrass beds to actually grow. Um, I, you know, I'm like drawn to this site Rome Point because it was in the 1970s, it was actually slated to be a nuclear power plant and it would have circulated water from the cooling towers into the bay and basically raising the temperature of the water of the bay, uh, which would totally change the ecologies. Um, but those plans for the nuclear power plant were stopped because of grassroots community action. And today it's, you know, it's a public access point to the shoreline, um, which I thought was a really great positive story um, to learn about. So in making these wall sculptures, I was just thinking about all these different connections and complexities and overlapping stories of both the seaweed and like people at the site. So like the base of it is actually supposed to mimic, you know, uh, nuclear cooling tower structure. You can actually see the seaweed and stuff in there too. Um, I also recently have started to think more about the native plant versus non-native plant paradigm. You know, how long does a plant need to exist in a place before it's considered native? How long do I need to exist in a place before I'm considered a resident? How long do plant and human immigrants need to be in a place before they're native? And it seems to me that we need a new, more dynamic and less like black and white sort of perspective and a more ecological perspective of looking at plants from um, other places. So nature isn't something that's static. It changes all the time and plants move around. Um, so rather than placing a false moral judgment on a plant species because of its country of origin, there's new thought among um, researchers and conservationists that we instead should be looking at the plant's actual function within local ecosystems. So plants, you know, are good or bad, native or alien. It's like kind of, let's try to like go further than this sort of simplistic way of viewing invasive plants that I think really supports, you know, through language, a mil militaristic relationship with the plant and with nature. So this is Willie Mullen, Mullion. On the left, it's a plant that grows in disturbed sites. So it just simply follows where humans have impacted a site already. Um, it also only grows where there's open soil. So it's not displacing native plants, but actually provides ground cover and food for pollinators in disturbed sites where other plants might have like trouble even getting established. 
Woolly mullen um, is actually native to Europe and Asia. Uh, it arrived in the Americas, I think in the 1700s with European colonization, um, has medicinal uses. You might've heard it also referred to as cowboy toilet paper because of its soft and fuzzy leaves. Um, so like that, you know, all that, that considered, like does this plant deserve to be demonized and hated as foreign at this point? Does it make sense to try to eradicate it, you know, taking in consideration what's happening locally within an ecology? Um, so these images are from an artist residency I did in the Guadalupe Mountains National Park in West Texas. So I work with woolly mullion and a few other plants to make some work. Um, this is um, one of a series I call Living Fossils. They're pulp types slash pulp paintings. And I was thinking about the emergence and disappearance um, of species over very long periods of time. So I was kind of seeking connections between, you know, what are present contemporary ecologies and connections with like ancient species that are still living or have become extinct. And the imagery is based on all these. I did these like blind drawings of fossilized fish from the Harvard Museum of Natural History. And so these you know, fossilized fish are like tens to hundreds of millions of years old. Um, and the colors for these pulp paintings um, are based off of color studies of surfaces and uh, my local Bay Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island. So I included uh, ginkgo biloba fiber um, in these pulp paintings. And ginkgo is a tree that is native to China and is one of the oldest living tree species in the world. So like older than the dinosaurs, like 200 million years old. Um, and I think I got lucky and found some that were on the ground in like a nearby park. Um, so I really wanted to understand the invasive plants I was using for paper making. So I completed the certification, like this training in invasive plant management from the University of Rhode Island. Um, and during this training, <laughs> we're all sitting there. I remember somebody like mentioning Japanese knotweed. <laughs> the whole room was like, boo. <laughs> Like sitting there, boo, booing Japanese knotweed. Um, and trust me, like if you have Japanese knotweed growing um, where you don't want it to grow, I understand. I worked with this community garden in Pawtucket for five years, clearing knotweed for community plots. And then we also like made paper um, from the fiber, like with after school programs and stuff. Um, it's, it's, and it's really, it's really can be an impossible goal to completely eradicate such a successful species. Um, however, you know, it can honestly be uncomfortable hearing people talk about invasive plants with such venom and this hatred and grr, like this aggression, um, when many invasive plant species in North America are from countries in Asia. And I know we know we all know we live in a time where there is a rise in violence against Asian Americans. So I think it's also time to reconsider what language we're using um, when we talk about plants from other places. You know, plants that yeah sure cause some trouble. Um, so alternatives, you know, as I'm reading and learning, uh, alternatives I've heard from like researchers and also indigenous peoples. Um, include like our displaced plant cousins, which I thought is nice because it's like, okay, we're all kins and cousins. We're all, <laughs> all these plants are related. Uh, troublesome plants are, you know, problematic plants. So I've been like trying them on for size and seeing like, you know, what feels good. That's like kind of a new thing for me. Um, you know, another thing to consider are urban sites. So places where Nothing else will really grow on its own. Places that humans have altered so much 
um, that are covered in all this concrete and buildings and so much so that the landscape doesn't even remotely have the same conditions as even like 200 years ago. Um, so, you know, think about this context, like isn't any life and isn't any vegetation better than no life? Um, so this is a public artwork that's called Great Salt Cove Macroalgae. There's three big pulp paintings, like eight feet by 10 feet, that I installed on this parking garage for a couple weeks in downtown Providence, Rhode Island. So at the site, there was once a tidal cove called Great Salt Cove. So that, you know, basically over the centuries has been filled in and is now completely filled in. But part of this work is, I think, imagining that like maybe once, hundreds of years ago, there were marine species, there were seaweeds once floating around where there's now these asphalt streets and like concrete parking garages. Um, and you know, the truth is that, you know, most human and natural communities consist of both like long-term residents and new arrivals. And there are ecosystems emerging that never existed before. Um, so, it, you know, it becomes like not practical to try to restore ecosystems to some like quote unquote rightful historical state at some specific point and random point in time. Um, so when, you know, these new species arrive and establish themselves, it's something called a novel ecosystem. Um, I've also heard like novel plant community, it's a nice phrase um, that incorporates these like newly arrived species and there's these new relationships forming between plants and other life. Um, so I think this conversation about like what language we choose uh, when talking about plants is also evident of like how we as a culture are viewing nature itself. So, you know, dominant Western culture here, you know, views humans as separate from and superior to nature. Um, and I took this really great online course called the Homie Eco Literacy Course for Creatives, and it's run by Dr. Kathy Fitzgerald, who actually has a background as a scientist and now as an artist. Uh, she's over in Ireland. And taking this course introduced me to this term. Um, ecocentric or ecocentrism. And basically it's the view or philosophy that humans are part of nature and that we are intimately interconnected with the earth. Um, uh, the course like oh, as a side also introduced me um, to some great thinkers. Uh, my favorite was Susie Gablik, who was like an art critic, an artist, writer, who's sort of like broke free of this modernist view as art that something is of no values, like it's purposeless, it's like separate from the world. It's like kind of individual approach to like being an artist and making art. And instead, you know, looking at people who are making art as if like the world mattered, you know, the environment and people and making art, you know, with this, you know, feeling of ethical, responsibility to society and the earth. I thought it was really great reading. It was a good course, I recommend it. Um, so this um, course really helped me to better consider what language I use. It also helped me realize that much of my work was already ecocentric and that my art practice is about forming relationships and a connection in my life with nature by spending time in landscapes and waterscapes um, and using plant fibers in my studio. I've like also become even more conscious of how my material use is actually impacting or could even benefit local ecosystems. And um, I've also come to understand my practice as a way to connect you know, culture with nature, you know, through sharing you know, what I'm witnessing in these sites. Um, and placing these plant species and waterways and all of their stories um, within this fine art world context. Uh, so one circle again, 
it was a series of temporary sculptures in public locations. So there were these interactions between myself and symptoms of our changing climate. So like think of like sea level rise and extreme weather events. If you go on my website, there's more photos of those. Um, each one of these temporary sculptures were questioning you know, sustainability in public art processes by only using site materials. And they're actually, <laughs> my like angsty response to a bad experience I had um, with a public art commission. And I ended up contacting the librarians, gay librarians um, at the National Museum for Women in the Arts. And they were so helpful and friendly. And they provided me with, you know, depressing data about biases against women and minorities um, in the public art field. Um, so I think like in these works, I was just beginning to understand, you know, the climate crisis and lack of diversity in the part, art world and seeing those as both symptoms of this same problem, which is, you know, this fractured view of how we relate to living systems and the living planet and you know, seeing the dominant culture and its lack of respect for the natural world. You know, when in reality, you know, humans aren't separate from water, soils, plants, species, we're one and the same. We, I breathe air, you breathe air. <laughs> we need clean water to drink. Um, and I think understanding this, you know, could help heal a lot of social and, you know, ecological fractures. And, you know, I, if it's a cultural shift that needs to happen, then I think that art does have leverage and it does have responsibility. Um, and I think art can help people understand themselves as part of nature and to help people understand themselves as ecological citizens and to maybe find a path towards a livable planet. Um, you know, I think it's a very hard thing to work towards this ecocentric worldview because it is counter to the dominant culture. You know, it's a culture like I was raised in and to like reframe how we relate to plants and nature um, and to reassess the language we choose to use, it's a hard thing. Um, and I know I'm only just beginning to understand this and to work towards this in my work. Um, and so along those lines, um, I've been recently invited to be a guest editor for Hand Papermaking Magazine. So the website is right there. Um, and I'm putting together an issue centered on the theme Paper and the Planet uh, that looks at, you know, so both contemporary handmade paper art um, and some production hand paper making that addresses you know, people's degradation of the planet, um, but also work that kind of contributes to this future where we can value, you know, and reintegrate nature and humanity. So there's a lot, a couple of different themes in there, material use, resiliency, and adaptation, um, extraction of natural resources and um, indigenous worldviews and some eco-social approaches. Um, that will be published this winter. So keep an eye out. There's some people doing really fantastic work and I'm so excited for that. And on here, you can also visit my artist website, um, maybabcock.com and you can sign up and you'll get um, my five insights into making paper and art from plants. And uh, you'll be on my list so you can hear of like any updates uh, and stuff in my work. Okay, I hope that was the right length. I'll stop sharing my slide, right? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, or we can go back to like um, just a beautiful artwork to chat over. So thank you so much. That was so rich. I took so many notes. <laughs> and uh, we can take your questions now. We already have a couple in the Q&A um, and we have until two. So um, okay. 
I hope that you get your questions. And oh, I'm glad you picked this one. I love this one. Um, so we have um, a couple questions already. Um, and condensing to, um, there's a question, what does your material processing look like? And then someone else asked more specifically, how do you work with seaweed, cooking it, breaking it down? Um, and do you mix it with other types of pulp like abaca? Oh yeah, I didn't include like actual processing photos <laughs> for y'all. I think there's some on my website, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> um, so I forage for either, you know, I know of a site with a specific plant or, you know, have permission to collect a plant. Um, I cut it up usually into one inch pieces and then, you know, cook until it's done. I think most things are like one to two hours. Seaweed doesn't need to be cooked that long. It's like 15 minutes, same for the pond weed. And I'm cooking it in an alkaline solution with um, washing soda or soda ash, depending on how tough the fiber is. Um, that sort of like cleans the fibers. And then um, all you're left with hopefully after rinsing that out is the cellulose fiber, which is what you need. And that's the stuff that paper is made of. And then I beat it to a pulp. So if I, I have a machine called the Hollander paper beater, my studio that chops up and fibrillates, so roughening the outside of the fibers, breaks it down and bruises the fibers, so it hydrates them into a paper pulp. Um, if I'm at an artist residency, I have like a nice like oak wooden stick, <laughs> very fancy. Does the same thing, but takes longer. And then if I have electricity, I have a little kitchen blender, which really only has cutting action to process the plant fibers into paper pulp. And then from there, you know, whatever I'm doing, like warming sheets with a paper mold and decal. So if you don't know what that is, it's like a frame with a screen. Screen catches the fibers that forms interwoven on the surface. And that's usually pressed and dried somehow. Um, you know, for some of the more sculptural stuff I do, you know, sometimes I don't do, you don't need the mold and decal, but yeah. And then the seaweed basically follows all of that. You know, there's like, like that pond weed, water chestnut is like pretty brittle. Um, so I do mix that with other fibers. So for me, it's like typically abaca or sometimes flax. I like that, I like flax with the pond weed and um, sometimes kozo. So more traditional paper making fibers that have some strength if I think the whole thing's gonna fall apart <laughs> okay Hope that um, that. yeah I think that that's uh from start to finish I, I was wondering how you do it on residencies also um oh. so hearing that you hand beat it is uh uh bold and courageous oh my gosh <laughs> yeah though I did like this residency in Montana <laughs> it was like so, so off-grid <laughs> it's like two hour drive from even like a landline phone like down a bumpy oh, wow. rocky road like I got my water from a creek <laughs> were you alone or did you have an artist cohort with you I had my partner with me okay <laughs> <laughs> a taste and of off-grid life we're, we're handed like bear spray and an emergency beacon <laughs> for a week uh so I didn't have electricity I did have like a little gas propane, you know, camp cooking thing to cook on. And then I was like, found a nice flat rock with a great mountain view and just handy <laughs> fibers and lugged the water from the creek. And yeah. yeah. Definitely very high effort artist residency. Um, there's a couple of requests in the chat for you to, or in the Q&A for you to write into the chat the name of the artist critic, uh, Susie or Susan Goodleek. Oh, 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 yeah. There's oh, yeah. multiple spelling requests. Susie. Uh, uh, thank you please. everyone for mentioning that. Yeah, I think um, there's the re-enchantment, re-enchantment, enchantment. 
I don't think I've spelled enchantment right. Um, <laughs> I think they'll find Sorry. it if, if you've got the name right. Um, um, yeah, she has lots of like great, a couple of great essays and a couple of great books. Good reads. Yes. Thanks. Um, so condensing a couple of questions again, um, there's a couple questions about how the public art um, lasts. Um, are you letting the weather collaborate with your pieces and change them? Or do you treat the works with a surface sizing or starch to make them resisting to, resistant to elements? Um, yeah, and, and that question a couple of times as well. And then there's another one. Um, could you share your thoughts about ephemerality or change in your work, which might hmm. be related? Yeah. Good questions. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I I think people are talking about the parking garage outdoor paper stuff. I think so. And there were some images of cyanotypes on brick that maybe looked outside. Oh, <laughs> I know. So the cyanotypes, the circular ones, I wanted to leave up and just let degrade. But the city was like, no, yeah. it's the eyesore, which is so hypocritical if you've ever been to Pawtucket. <laughs> I mean, that's just so insulting. It was not the prettiest city I've ever seen. <laughs> that was a disappointment. I would have loved for that to just degrade and be ephemeral and just not last and just change, you know? Um, then the one that, the Great Salt Cove macroalgae. So that was like actually coincided with this huge festival in downtown Providence. So those had to be like, lame retarded they couldn't fall on people's heads <laughs> I had to make sure it was nice and sturdy so I chose like super strong fibers like Koso flax um and the internal sizing and then I actually coated them in this natural coating um from a company called Vermont Natural Coatings it's actually like this cheese byproduct floor coating that I coated them with um so like low VOCs and all that um yeah so they were up for three weeks no problem they are like rolled up right now <laughs> in my sun porch uh, they're still a good they're gonna be in like a seaweed exhibition in New Bedford Massachusetts um, the second half of this year, I think starting in June. Oh, that's fantastic. Pittsburgh Whaling Museum. <laughs> they look um, extremely challenging to install. It was actually really easy. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because um, the trick is, I'll share a trick for hanging stuff outside. So I got like electrical conduit, like hollow piping. It's pretty lightweight. And you wrap when it's, the paper is just formed, you wrap it around the conduit so it's hidden. And then we slipped, um, and that's at the top and bottom. And then I slipped chain through it. So then that was just like looped. The chain was looped around the columns. So it's, that was like a real quick. Wow, that's very just, inventive. Like, higher on the right, um, <laughs> a little lower. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, um, so when you say it's wrapped around, you mean there's multiple layers of paper embedding the tube? Yeah, I like. Yeah, set the tube like a few, yeah, maybe like three inches in enough to wrap the whole pipe with the sheet itself. And then I think mm -hmm. I poured extra pulp on the seam and just like made sure I like pressed that down pretty well. So I think like it was basically like embedded securely in there. So yeah. That's really clever. That was my personal question. No one asked that, but I'm glad to know. Um, so there, there's a two that might be related. Um, uh, someone is encouraging you to talk about paper slurry, and someone else asks if you teach anywhere. Oh, they are related, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Paper slurry. Yeah, I started that when I was a beginner, and I graduated from LSU, and I this was like back in the day like 2011 2012 and if you looked online like you couldn't find hardly any information 
on paper making. Like you had to know to like, I think there was like a Yahoo group <laughs> back then and uh, or like have access to and paper making back issues, the magazine back issues. So I started just blogging as I learned and grew and it's um, paperslurry.com. It's become, I think, a real resource for people who are also just starting out and just like want like sort of like, like where are other paper makers and how do I just make some paper? <laughs> um, so there's a, uh, I made like a map that of all these different paper making studios and artists and that's is really really popular it was like over a million views um and then i recently decided to focus on teaching online so that's what i'm like working on right now through paper slurry is to teach um through that because i you know get a lot of emails through that and it just seems like there's a lot of people who like want to learn, but maybe they're like not close to like a, another paper making artist or a paper making studio. Um, Cause you know, like, I feel like hand paper making like in the art world, it's like not as mainstream as painting, <laughs> photography. <laughs> um, so I feel like, yeah, I think this could be really beneficial for me to offer some like online education for people to help them learn paper making, even if, you know, they can't travel to go teach or travel to go um, learn somewhere. So that's what I'm doing this year. So I yeah, guess definitely. go to paperslayer.com and sign up for the list and it'll be looped in. Uh, someone writes um, that it's so helpful. Right? So, oh, great. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> Um, so we have some more, oh, uh, actually multiple people wanted us to show the artwork we were describing on the parking garage. I apologize that oh. that was abstract, but can we skip back to that image? Yeah, we can find it. Um, sorry, everyone. Thanks for highlighting that we, we weren't showing what we were talking about. Um, and then someone asks if you found any graffiti on the bottom panel. No, no. Nope. Very lucky. Everyone knew it was too good to ruin. <laughs> Um, I wouldn't mind if someone that. did, whatever. <laughs> Sanctioned, unsanctioned art. <laughs> um, okay, so um, there's uh, lots more questions, which is great. Um, so I'm, I'm combining two sort of process questions. Um, can you talk through your setup for making large eight foot by 10 foot sheets? And then there's a separate question that's also a process about using what you're using as a mold and deckle for large paper um, mm. and how many people do you need to pull these sheets? Mm. And I think I saw another one um, about your mold and frame on the beach and how you maybe built it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so those are like two separate. Yeah, you can answer them separately. <laughs> yeah, yeah, those are two separate approaches. So these guys, um, you, if you look up, this paper making artist, Hong Kong, she designed a modular mold and deckle. And so um, it's kind of like these, there's like a frame and then screens that are set up on there and tied together. And then the deckle is just like two by fours on the edges. And then you're just like pouring pulp in there. So I encourage you to like look up Hong Kong's work and I think she does teach that uh, modular pour mold method in, or has taught places um, um, for that system. So that's how I um, made these big pieces. So you don't really need, you can do it by yourself, I think, which is the great part um, about doing it that method. And then the other, so this method, I guess I sort of just made it up. <laughs> it is uh, PVC pipes you like for plumbing and then the mesh is a silk screen mesh and the whole thing um, comes apart because I was like hiking in to this spot on the coast and I needed to like collapse the whole mold 
So it ended up looking like a couple PVC pipes and um, the clips and then the silk screen. Um, so I would like hike over to the spot and then assemble the mold. And I have a picture here, but I think I'm gonna share some video soon to my email, the artist email list um, from that residency. Um, so I like dragged um, the frame with the screen like closer to the shore and was pouring pulp in there. And I actually was using like the wave action to create prints in the pulp and then would drag it back up to like fill in all the empty areas. Um, Cause it's like this really amazing um, coastal dune system along the Cape Cod National Seashore. I'm actually going there Monday. <laughs> Some artwork. I'm so excited to go hiking. Um, yeah, so those are, I don't know what size that is. Pretty big. Three feet by five feet, maybe. They look sizable. Yeah. Um, I think we like another... designed it so it like just fit in my car. <laughs> it was like a portable way of making big paper. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah. and it worked. Um, we have another process question that I also share. Um, can you describe the pulp type process mentioned earlier? And oh, maybe sure. for everyone, we can scoot back to, yeah, one of the images. Uh, let's go back to like the first one. Where's that? Okay. So I think these ones actually had like a big deco box. So it's kind of like you just like had mold and deco higher edges. And I um, form the sheets. With that, so a nice sturdy base sheet. They use a lot of recycled cotton paper scraps for these. So that's like the lighter areas that you see. And that's formed on uh, Pellon. So like a non-fusible interfacing. It's like a cloth. It's a, a lot of paper makers use that. Um, and then for uh, the darker areas, I beat the pulp like super fine and super short. Like it's almost like you couldn't form paper with it. It's beaten so finely, like like a like cottage cheese texture. And I pigment that, that dark color. Um, and then I lay down, I think I used, um, you can either use like a really thin Pellon or you can use like a silk screen laid on a mold. And I pour the pigmented pulp on there. And I use that as sort of like, my plexiglass surface. So if you've done any monotype printmaking, you're like rolling ink on a plexiglass and like removing and drawing on there. It's the same idea. Like I like pour the ink on my, you know, silk screen surface and scrape away and pour and pull areas and make my drawing. It's like a pretty active way of drawing. Um, and then I like flip that whole thing face down on like the wet base sheet that, um, the white area. So like with monotype printmaking, you would just like lay down a piece of paper and run it through a press and that would leave the ink, your ink drawing that was on the plexiglass and leave it on your paper. So kind of like the same idea, but all paper pulp. That was because I didn't have any printmaking presses to make prints. So, you know, you just make it work. I hope that answers it. That probably was a convoluted description, but. It made sense to me. I hope it made sense to everyone else. Um, okay, I hope so. <laughs> um, I'm sure we'll hear from everyone if it didn't. Um, so this talk has been so informative. Thank you for being so descriptive and sharing the resources that you accessed in order to learn more about plants. Can you talk about how the traditional papermaking fibers like abaca cotton flax that you're using and the plants that your research is focusing on might be in conversation if you think that they are? Yeah, I think they're definitely in conversation. I think I talked more about that when I was part of that panel back in 2019 uh, about like Asian diaspora and paper making. And yeah, you, know, you know, I think it has for me, I'm not like working within a specific tradition of paper making. Um, I started making paper you know, very much from an experimental approach. And uh, I would like describe my studio equipment and processes as like 
taking a little bit of this and a little bit of that and just, you know, using what I have and making it work. And, you know, that goes for the fibers too. Like I've really, you know, grown to appreciate the different qualities and capabilities of, you know, these other, you know, traditional fibers, whether it's, you know, linen rag. I, lo I love linen rag. <laughs> and I love flax. And Koza is awesome too for different reasons. And, you know, I feel like, yeah, it's kind of, what I don't want to say melting pot because that sounds corny, but sure. <laughs> Well, there's all different reasons to appreciate them, right? For some of them as a craftsperson, some of them for their aesthetic, some of them for the conceptual weight that they bring to the paper. And right. it sounds like all of them matter to you. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have a big question. Given the extensive use of water in hand paper making, can you speak to any scientific, oh, sorry, specific actions you take re-water use slash conservation and water management slash pollution reduction, particularly in the context of working with troublesome plants? Will this sort of information possibly be included in your magazine edition of hand paper making? <laughs> that would be a whole other issue, I think. Uh, like, look, maybe your guest editing part two. <laughs> water management feel like a whole book I feel like I've done like good reading on it I mean personally in my studio I try to reuse water as much as possible so I'm not like dumping it down the drain constantly um you know and like reusing my cook water as much as possible um and I like spent some time like looking up like okay what do you do with like the leftover look cooking liquor that's leftover because it has like soda ash or washing soda in it and it's just like basically a salt from my understandings and you know sometimes if it's really thick I would like just water it down I put it in my bushes <laughs> bushes seem happy enough so it's not like a pollutant uh, as far as I understand I feel like there's maybe some other paper makers who also I think like Amy Lee I feel like I read something good I heard something good from her about that um and I'll I am her very, name in the chat for everyone yeah sorry to interrupt you oh sure, yeah and I, you know I am very conscious of it like when I was in West Texas I guess it was very dry but weirdly like the day I arrived the rain summer rains came so I only used rainwater to make paper the whole time I was there because of I just collect like found bins from whatever closets <laughs> collected the rainwater um yeah and then yeah doing that Cape Cod residency was like interesting because I just wanted to like get back to making paper in place I didn't show it in this talk but um in graduate school I was like pouring paper pulp on the Mississippi River levee and like made this cast and stuff so I was like thinking about, you know, okay, maybe I can like revisit this thing and, you know, make paper with seawater. So it's like saltwater paper, you know, so I'm not like using up groundwater, but, you know, like at such a small scale, like small scale, it's like. It's a bit like a drop five in the minutes bucket. of your shower make a difference when <laughs> right. big agriculture is using so much of the the clean water. Right. Um, I like do what I can, but it's like when the golf course a half a block sure. away is fertilizing and using all this water. <laughs> what is my little <laughs> what impact can I have? I don't know. Maybe it's just like mm -hmm like symbolic, you know, at my scale that I work as an individual, you know. Sure, and it informs the work. So we are past two. Oh. I wanna highlight um, the people who have said thank you to you because I, I also thank you very much. And I thank everyone who came. And I also wanna read it out to you. One person added in the Q and A that artists are the best problem solvers ever. And I think that we've really learned that from your talk. So a huge thank you to May Babcock and um, a huge thank you for everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, and I'm going to end the webinar. Thanks, Bye, everyone. everyone. Thanks so much for attending. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the 
kind words and thank you Hannah this is fun <laughs> yeah thanks for joining us okay more soon bye everyone okay.